had this nice little construction where we, we had our two points that we started with and we had an interval. And we called this guy some, some LAB. So there's a line segment from A to B. And we called this particular guy S naught. And then what we did right was, was that we started making new examples by coming out to isosceles triangles, boop, 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 moving out some, some epsilon times the length in this direction, and, and continuing this process so forth and so on to, to, to get our, 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 our S's, right? So, so our, as we had written it before, our SI, which was supposed to be a union of L I J, L A I J plus one of piecewise linear guys. And what we did was we let S I plus one be equal to the union of L epsilon, um, which was exactly what this thing here was, right? We applied to each line segment of the A I J's A I j plus ones to get our piecewise linear guys. And what we said was we got this nice sort of Reifenberg curve in the end that was biholder, and we sort of outlined anyway where the biholder construction was going to come from. So, so two points on this. Uh, one is that, as was pointed out by several of you, that's not Reifenberg. Um, it's a one-line fix. Uh, so, so what I did wrong was the following. So the way I described it is I said, OK, let's push this out, and then let's push out again and push out again, and keep pushing out like this. And of course, that's silly, because after like, you know, just stare at this point, what you're going to have is an angle that looks like that after a finite number of steps, and clearly that's not Reifenberg. Um, what you have to do is alternate. You can always go out this way or go out that way, and you have to alternate, right? So, so what you need to do for step two, for instance, is that should actually look like this. And then this guy for step three will be something like this. Uh, that was down, dup, 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 and so forth and so on. Um, I mean, it's 10 lines to check that, that fixes it, but it's one line to fix it. So, so what you should really do is view this as the following, i plus j times epsilon. So if it's negative, that means you move in the non-oriented direction. Right? And what happens when you do it like this is that the, the, I mean, the angles will still move in every switch direction as they have to, but they'll be continuous with respect to one another. So when you fix it one point, it'll still look like a line on a scale, so it'll have the Reifenberg condition. And every other computation we did is absolutely verbatim. I mean, that actually didn't depend on this, just that one condition. So yeah, you got to alternate. Um, we will come back to this example. I think the way I'm going to do this is the following. So I, I actually, I, I want to understand the biholder a little better for this example. Um, in fact, I want to do it way different than the way I outlined before, because it's, it's more motivating of how Reifenberg will work. But lecture four is dedicated to the proof of the next structure theorem, which, as I said, the, the proof of the classical Reifenberg is set up to kind of mimic this. So I'm going to come back to this example in lecture four and do it more carefully at the beginning of that. Okay, and for now, we'll kind of just move on and recall this as being a nice Reifenberg example that showed the sharpness of everything. So what I'm going to do today, then, is the following. I, I want to talk about a, a more general Reifenberg theorem, um, some, something for, for measures to deal with a few issues. And, and we're going to basically build a lot of background to try to understand this. I think I'm going to leave this here in that board blank, because I am going to come back to a, a slight refinement to this example in a moment. Um, so, so the, 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 the idea is what? So, so, I mean, the Reifenberg was knee, right? So, so it said that if we had a set and we could approximate it by, by affine planes on all scales, then it had to be biholder to, to a manifold. And this is pretty interesting. Um, in practice, uh, um, when we want to apply these things to singular sets, uh, um, it doesn't work like that. It's not quite so clean. So there's a variety of issues that appear if you're trying to use the classical Reifenberg. And, and let me list them for you. So the first issue, so one of these is sort of not such a big deal. The other two are bigger deals. Um, so the Hausdorff distance, I'm not going to write every line. So Hausdorff distance used in the definition is like an L infinity bound. And as happens in PDEs, you don't have L infinity bounds. You have LP bounds of some sort or another. In particular, for, for most of the equations um, that this has been applied to so far, it's more like L2 bounds or integral bounds. Um, so, so in practice, we want an integral bound on things.
integral. Um, so this is going to be not horrible to fix. So, so what we're going to end up doing uh, at some point in this lecture is introducing something called the Jones beta number, right? Well, which is, I mean, to fix this, the main point that one, one really wants to think through is that you're not applying it to sets anymore, where L infinity makes sense. You're going to apply it to measures, right? So we need to move to the measure world. And when you move to the measure world, you, it's now open that you have things besides L infinity of other LP sort of estimates. And this is what the Jones beta numbers are. And we'll introduce those and work with those probably for half this lecture. I mean, this is what we want to get a little bit of a feel for. Second problem. Um, in applications, our, our, our sets or our measures, which are supposed to be like singular sets of things in practice, um, the measures have holes. Actually, more to the point, they simply don't satisfy the Reifenberg condition, which is to say, you know, it's not a question of holes or not holes. You just don't have a Reifenberg condition. So, so that might sound like a deal breaker, um, but what happens is basically the following, that this is where the notion of a neck region is going to come into play and the notion of a neck decomposition. A general measure um, is a general measure, um, but we will break it into pieces where it turns out if we have some sort of integrable con control, even if it's some large number uh, on our beta numbers, it turns out that most pieces, that were not most, but at least that there, there, there will be lots of balls for which uh, it will have sort of a weak version of the Reifenberg condition. So, so on the whole, it may not be true, but we can at least focus on so-called neck regions where we have sort of a weak version of this to actually work with. So, so we'll need neck regions to deal with this and the neck decomposition theorem, which, which the decomposition is basically saying most regions either are neck regions or at least have some other bounds that are useful. And the third point, and this, this is also a deal breaker, by holders too weak. So in practice, right, when we're studying things, say singular sets of nonlinear equations, we want two things. We want manifold structures, rectifiable structures, which I also def defined for you today, which are like by Lipschitz manifold structures. Um, and we want volume bounds on the singular sets. We want to know the singular sets aren't too big. Um, and by holder doesn't do this, right? By holder's all kinds of crazy. We need controlling gradients to do this. So, so what we need essentially is, is a stronger condition to get a stronger result, because we know Reifenberg doesn't do this. Um, <clears throat> and actually, to discuss this a little bit, I want to go back to this example real quick, just so we can see how, how it is that even in this sort of silly situation where we keep sort of doing a piecewise linear guy, and that is an ugly picture at this point. I just don't like leaving that up there. It bugs me. Let's fix that. We should stare at something pretty. Boop. Boop. And let's say boop, 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 doop. Okay. So let's look at the same example where we keep taking our piecewise linear guys and breaking it up into more piecewise linear guys, but let's do something else. Uh, on, on top of this, right, so how do we get from, from you know, our, our S0 to our S1? We went up by epsilon, right? So, so to go up from here, we went up by epsilon. Well, instead, what we could do, actually, is move up by a different amount on each, right? There, there, there's no reason not to. It's a perfectly interesting thing to study, right? So we can move up by some epsilon naught here, whatever that is. We can move up by some epsilon 1 here, whatever that is. And in general, we can move up by some epsilon i plus 1, whatever this is here, right? right? So, so it's the exact same construction. Um, and we, we can even insist these are all at most some epsilon if you want. I don't care. I'm interested in small, not big here. Um, but we could, uh, if we wanted to, actually move out by less and less. And now what happens when we do this? So recall our computation from yesterday, uh, w w which was simply that if we want to know how the length changed, right, then the length of SI plus 1, well, we got to it by saying it was the square root of 1 plus epsilon squared times the length of SI. This is just because we do our nice little Pythagorean theorem here. And now, of course, if we're moving out by a different amount at each, sta at at each stage, it, it's going to be more like, I think this is like an i the way this is written, but whatever. Um, it's going to be 1 plus epsilon i squared. Now, for curves, right, right, 
by Lipschitz structure, gradient structure, and volume are all the same, right, right? So life's very easy. So what we're really asking here, right, the problem was that the volume of this thing for a constant epsilon was going to infinity, right? So that, that, that meant in principle that our actual volume was four times the product of the, the square roots of one plus epsilon i squareds, and that clearly just goes to infinity if these are all epsilons. But now one can ask the question, well, when does it not go to infinity? And, and, and you get a pretty clear answer from this, right? And the answer is pretty interesting, because the square root of one plus epsilon squared, let me just sort of fake it out a little bit here. This is roughly speaking, four times the product of one plus epsilon i squared. Right, so Taylor series your guy out a little bit if you want, because these are small. And, and this here is going to be finite, right, if and only if the sum of epsilon i squareds is finite. And even though I, I'm, I'm you know, being a little fake from, from here to here and here to here, this is certainly a true statement. Right, right? It's finite if and only if that sum of epsilon i squares is finite. What that's telling you is that if I actually want a rectifiable curve here, an actual curve of finite length, then what I am stuck with here is that not only do these epsilon i's have to be going to zero, but that's not enough. They have to be going to zero sufficiently fast that, that, that they're, they're, their squares are summable. Um, the fact that there's a square here is really good and really bad. Uh, um, so, so it's much better than it being epsilon i, and the fact that it's a square is what lets you get away for, for, for nonlinear equations. It turns out that square is precisely what you can control for, for some nonlinear equations. No better, no worse. I, if that was any other constant, you, you, you'd be in bad water. Um, let, let me point out that, that this sort of moral from this example uh, what, what was refined by, by David and Toro into a theorem that said if you had a Reifenberg set for which uh, um, on each scale, right, your epsilon i Reifenberg with it, with it being summable at each point and bounded, you actually do in fact have a, a, a rectifiable curve at the end. Okay, good. So, so now that we have some motivation of where we're heading, we need that, that, and that. So let's start with the following. I'm going to crash course you on content. So, so um, wh when you are doing, well, this or any type of quantitative analysis or, or, or PDs this, nowadays, um, you want to talk about sizes of sets, of course. And, and there's more than one notion of a size of a set. And, and what notion you, you deal with uh, actually is quite important. And the three notions here I'm going to talk about are Hausdorff, Minkowski, and packing content. They're, they're extremely similar. Let me just give you the definition so we can get some feel for what's happening here. That this will make a difference when we start getting really careful about all of our analysis. So I'm taking a side route now, so we're totally changing topics. Definition. And this is, this is of content. So let's take a set. Uh, doesn't need to be closed. can be whatever you want, some set. And R positive. Both of these are fixed. Then the k-dimensional Hausdorff R content. It's a lot of words. Um, I'll write the first one out. K-dimensional Hausdorff R content of this set is the following. It's, well, we denote it by HK sub R of S, right? And it's defined to be the inf over the following. Essentially, we're going to look at the imp of all coverings of S by balls of radius at most R and sum up their volumes, their k-dimensional volumes. So, so WK, R, I to the K, such that S is contained in the union of the ball of radius RI or an XI. And R here, RIs all have to be less than or equal to R in our assumption. Right, so I'm saying, let's draw a picture. Here's S. I'm allowed to cover this thing by balls of whatever radius I want. It has to be covered. They can't be bigger than R. And then I sum up the k-dimensional volumes of these things to figure out how big you are. Two. Um, the k-dimensional Minkowski R content is the following. So with an M, 
So this is, we can write this two ways actually. It's r to the k minus n times the volume of the ball of radius r around s. Um, equivalently up to a, a constant, right, that th this is the imp over the sums of the k-dimensional volumes of balls of radius r, the ri are not allowed to vary anymore, such that s is contained inside the union of the balls of radius r of xi, right? So, so for Hausdorff, I can get any covering I want. For Minkowski, I have to cover by balls of radius r, right? So it should be clear, this guy here should be bigger than this in principle, right? I, I'm very much restricting the, the, the amount of covers I have here. Right? They all have to have the same size to them. And three, the packing content of a set. If you want the R packing content, but actually in practice I won't care about the R so much. Um, is, uh, actually I'm gonna make this a soup now. Of the sum of omega k ri to the k uh, such that the balls of radius ri on xi are disjoint. So I'll explain this. And xi is an s. So when you soup out something like this, you know, basically a Vitali argument tells you the balls of five times that radius cover it. Right, right? So, so what's happening here is that here I'm covering by balls of any radius and saying if I can find some covering for which this, th that this is finite, then I have control. This is saying if that covering is by balls of the same radius, then I have control. And this is saying I have to be able to cover it by absolutely anything and I have control. Right, right? So packing content insists that not, not, not only uh, is there some covering which is controlled, but every covering of it is controlled. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. They're all constrained. Oh, yeah, they're constrained to be at most R. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. I am running out of room. If you have my notes, this is written verbatim. I'll try to write bigger after this. Sorry, I was getting squished. Okay. So, classically speaking, people control this Hausdorff measure. This turns out to stink for lots of reasons. Sometimes it's all that's true, mind you, but, but it stinks, right, right? And let's just look at one example to understand why. Um, in particular, if you're doing anything quantitative, if you're solving PDEs and trying to get estimates, this is a horrible thing to control. And let's just do one example to see this. And in the problem session, your TA will uh, work out this, uh, a series of examples a little bit better. You have an exercise on this, which I've written incorrectly. So he's going to fix it and, and then solve it. So let's let S be the rationals inside the ball of radius 1. Then, for any R, what do we know? The, the k-dimensional Hausdorff R content of this set S, uh, well, I mean, I don't know exactly what it is, but it goes to zero as R goes to zero. This is basically set up for, for any k, sorry, positive strictly bigger than zero. So, so if k here is bigger than zero, then the k-dimensional R content goes to zero, right? Whereas if k is zero, well, it's actually just gonna go to infinity. So what this means here is that this is zero dimensional from a Hausdorff point of view. Right? That, that, that's exactly what this statement is here, in fact. So roughly speaking, how do you see this, um, just to give an idea? This is a countable set, right? 
So, so what I can do is enumerate it in some way, pick the radius r, let the first element be covered by a ball of radius r, the second element be covered by the ball of radius um, 1 half r, then 1 fourth r, then 1 eighth r, so forth and so on. And in fact, I think we just proved that's like 2r, right? So, so this is, uh, well, bounded by 2r anyway, is what we just proved, right? So countable sets. Right, are, are very well behaved from the Hausdorff point of view. Right, right? I mean, they have, they're zero dimensional, is what this is saying. Now, why is that awful if you're, if you're doing analysis? Well, if you're doing quantitative analysis, you know, the closure of this set is the entire ball. It's everything. You have no real control. I mean, if you're trying to push away from this set, it may be small in a dimensional sense, but it's a big set in the sense that you can never get away from it, right? It's dense inside the, the, the ball of radius one. And one sees this directly through, through the Minkowski and packing content. Right, so if we look at the Minkowski and this turns out to be roughly equivalent to the, the packing content of this thing, then in fact, this is just covering all of them by balls of radius r, right? Which means you've now just covered the entire ball of radius 1 by, ball, by, by balls of radius r. So all you're getting here is that it's roughly equal to r to the k minus n. So in particular, if k is less than n, it goes to infinity, right? And it's only bounded if k equals n. So, so from, from a Hausdorff point of view, this is a zero-dimensional set. From a Minkowski and Packing point of view, it's an n-dimensional set, right? And, and actually, we like that, right? Because if we can, can control sets in a Minkowski or Packing way, which will be very important in what we're saying later on, we're really doing a much better job of controlling our set. Right, so this is... Okay. Uh, let me point out actually in words why you're going to care about packing estimates in a minute. So, so, I mean, the end results will prove packing estimates on things, not just Hausdorff. We will directly use that in a corollary because, well, what a packing estimate gives that, that other estimates don't, right, is that imagine you have some set, right, right, you're trying to control the set. So maybe the first thing you've done is, is prove some sort of control, Hausdorff control or, or packing control over the set. But now imagine you're trying to prove something more refined about it. So what you're going to want to do is cover this set, but not by some arbitrary collection of balls. You're going to want to cover it by balls that are special, right? This makes sense. This is what we do as analysts, right? We find nice balls to cover things by. But if those balls are nice, you may not know what radii they are. Maybe you can prove there exists some nice balls, but you have no idea what they look like, at which point a Hausdorff control is not sufficient. You have to know that you have a packing control, and therefore, whatever covering this is, we can control the covering by nice balls. Right? And we'll actually have a direct use of this in, uh, by the end of the lecture, I think. At least I'll point out where it's directly used. Also, when you're proving uh, a priori estimates for, for nonlinear equations, it's the Minkowski estimates that do it, not the Hausdorff estimates. So one really wants this sort of effective control. Okay, so fine. We've crash coursed packing estimates. Yay. Um, crash course number two, rectifiability. So And I'm going to focus on sets. You can do something very similar for measures. OK. So, so what does rectifiable mean? So what, 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 what is a nice space? Well, the nicest space out there is Euclidean space. Um, what's the next nicest thing you might do? You, you might be a manifold, right? So maybe you're Euclidean space, but geometrically spinning, uh, speaking, maybe you bend a little bit. These, these are things that we know how to do analysis on. We like these things. So, so you know, we, we, we like subsets of Euclidean space that are themselves manifolds. That will be best, right? It would be really nice to talk about, let, let, let's find a, let, let, like with the Reifenberg set, let, 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 let's find a set which is actually a manifold in one sense or another. So what we want about these manifold things are two, two pieces. 
Um, one, we like the topology, but we're going to give that up in just a minute. And two, we like the fact that we can do analysis on them because there's a bi Lipschitz structure. Um, that there's a notion on manifolds of things like derivatives, gradient, integration, everything you need to sort of work as an analyst, it's there. And if you think for a while about, you know, well, well what, what's somehow the, 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 the strongest looking set that's completely awful, but we still have all those things in Euclidean space, rectifiable sets kind of fall in that category. So they're very much like k-dimensional manifolds, but, but we're going to basically throw some stuff out because it turns out if you throw stuff out, we can still work with them uh, as, as analysts. So, so let me start with, with what's going to be a, an annoying definition. So the flat out definition is the following. And one can be sure people struggled for a decade to, to, to get this one right. So let S be a subset of Euclidean space. Uh, we say S is K rectifiable. Uh, if uh, I'm, I'm going to define something called, I mean, there's actually about 16 different names you might throw in front of rectifiable for different versions of rectifiable. I'm going to technically define what some people call countably rectifiable, and I'll, I'll point out the differences. Uh, S is K rectifiable if, there's a, if there exists a countable collection of Lipschitz maps. Whatever. If you want good English, you're going to have to look at the notes. I have limited room. Fi, which maps from some sets Si, which are subsets of Rk now. Right? So, so this is supposed to be K rectifiable. So now I have a whole bunch of subsets of Rk, right? Into Rn, such that the images of these sets are going to cover S up to a set of measure zero. That, that's the statement. Oops, did I define measure for you? I might have skipped that. That's OK. I saw my board over there. It's one line. Such that the k-dimensional measure, you just limit r to 0. I'll write it precisely over there, of s minus the images of these sets equals 0. So almost every point of s is in the image of a Lipschitz map coming from, from RK. That doesn't sound like a lot if this is the first time you've seen this structure. That, that sounds pretty bad. Um, however, you can essentially um, restrict yourself and assume that the, 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 these Lipschitz maps are actually by Lipschitz maps, um, by Lipschitz embeddings. Right? There, there's no harm in that. So, so you know, view these things as actually being images that are fairly nice, right? That they're, they're spanning a submanifold that's by Lipschitz. And the k-dimensional Hausdorff measure of a set S is literally just the limit of that as r goes to 0. So that's all. OK, so let's talk about a few examples here. Um, just to get a feel for essentially how nasty this can look. And basically, the example I'm going to give you is really more or less as nasty as it gets, give or take. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow that up by saying how nice these sets are. So examples. What's that? Right now, I'm not assuming anything about it, right? So th there's, there's two, right? So, so what, he, what he's really asking about here are two things. Um, so, so first off, sometimes you might assume S has finite k-dimensional measure, 
right? That's oftentimes done. Um, I'm not doing it. I, I, I will explicitly simply say when a set has finite k-dimensional measure um, and when I want, usually because I care about packing in Minkowski anyway. Secondly, when you say this, you might actually assume it's a finite number of balls, not a countable number. Some people call this a countable rectifiable set, right? And there, there's a whole bunch of other versions of this floating around. So, examples. Let SK in RN. And I don't know, you can intersect this with the ball of radius one if you want it to be a compact set, that's fine. Um, be a k-dimensional submanifold. I'm going to assume smooth, but the point of the definition is you really only have to assume kind of Lipschitz. But let's just say smooth, why not? Right. Clearly, this is k-rectifiable. Right, right. This is the point. Right. So, so essentially, at every point, there's a neighborhood uh, of this thing, which is going to be diffeomorphic to, to a ball in RK, right? union all those maps up. Right, right. So that this, this is going to be k-rectifiable. First point of nastiness. Let S tilde K okay, be a subset, be any measurable subset, your favorite measurable subset in the world. This is also K rectifiable. So, so the key difference here, right, is that sometimes people will sort of fakely uh, view a k-rectifiable set as being a k-manifold. And this is kind of true, but the point is it's true away from a set uh, of measure zero, and that measure zero set need not be closed, which means all topology goes away, right? right? So, so th th this, this can be all kinds of nastiness sitting inside here. It turns out not to be that bad, right? There's still going to be tangents at almost every point here. It's still going to really look like a manifold from, from a, every um, analysis point of view. So, so we're okay with this. So th th this is it. Uh, how do you get this, by the way? Take, take your, 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 you know, your diffeomorphism maps for this guy, and for each of these guys, just pull, them, pull it back on this. And th those are your, your SIs over here, right? So any subset of RK in particular is, uh, is k-rectifiable. And now, just to make this frustrating, uh, let's let S, that's a tilde, maybe I'll call it a hat, whatever, K, be the union over all rationals of this S tilde translated by Q. Right, so, so think about dimension one for a second. I'll draw a picture. Pictures are nice. So, so if we're in R2, here's the plane R2, right? Here could be my S1. I can take any subset that I want of that. And now what I can start doing is moving it up and down by, by, by translations, by, by rationals. So what I actually get is a union, a countable union of all these things that are floating around here. So that's also k-rectifiable. So, so why can you still work with a countable union of such things? Because you know, if you're an analyst, you can basically just work with each one individually, more or less. It's more subtle than that, but you know, as a first approximation. Okay. And now I'm not going to go through it, but you have at least written your notes, and actually, 